Thank you, Alex. Uh, Gary, are you ready? Yes, I am. Please. Lauded be thy name, O my God. I testify that no thought of thee, however wondrous, can ever ascend into the heaven of thy knowledge. And no praise of thee, no matter how transcendent, can soar up to the atmosphere of thy wisdom. From eternity, thou hast been removed far above the reach and the ken of the comprehension of thy servants and immeasurably exalted above the strivings of thy bond slaves to express thy mystery. What power can the shadowy creature claim to possess when face to face with him who is the uncreated? I bear witness that the highest thoughts of all such as endure, adore thy unity and the profoundest contemplations of all them that have recognized thee are but the product of what hath been generated through the movement of thy pen of thy, be of thy behest and hath been begotten by thy will. I swear by thy glory, O thou who art the beloved of my soul and the fountain of my life, I am persuaded of my powerlessness to describe and extol thee in a manner that becometh the greatness of thy glory and the excellence of thy majesty. Aware as I am of this, I beseech thee by thy mercy that has surpassed all created things and thy grace that hath embraced the entire creation to accept from thy servants what they are capable of showing forth in thy path. Aid them then by thy strengthening grace to exalt thy word and to blazon thy praise. Powerful art thou to do what pleaseth thee. Thou truly art the all-glorious, the all-wise. Thank you, Gary. Albors, are you ready? I am ready. This is the beginning of gleaning number 27. All praise to the unity of God and all honor to him, the sovereign Lord, the incomparable and all glorious ruler of the universe, who out of utter nothingness hath created the reality of all things, who from naught hath brought into being the most refined and subtle elements of his creation, and who, rescuing his creatures from the abasement of remoteness and the perils of ultimate extinction, hath received them into his kingdom of incorruptible glory. Nothing short of his all-encompassing grace, his all-pervading mercy, could have possibly achieved it. How could it otherwise have been possible for sheer nothingness to have acquired by itself the worthiness and capacity to emerge from its state of non-existence into the realm of being? Having created the world and all that liveth and moveth therein, he, through the operation of his unconstrained and sovereign will, chose to confer upon man the unique distinction and capacity to know him and to love him a capacity that must needs be regarded as the generating impulse and the primary purpose underlying the whole of creation. Upon the inmost reality of each and every created thing, he hath shed the light of one of his names and made it a recipient of the glory of one of his attributes. Upon the reality of man, however, he hath focused the radiance of all his names and attributes and made it a mirror of his own self. Alone of all created things, man hath been singled out for so great a favor, so enduring a bounty. These energies with which the day star of divine bounty and source of heavenly guidance hath endowed the reality of man lie, however, latent within him, even as the flame is hidden within the candle and the rays of light are potentially present in the lamp. The radiance of these energies may be obscured by worldly desires, even as the light of the sun can be concealed beneath the dust and dross which cover the mirror. 
Neither the candle nor the lamp can be lighted through their own unaided efforts, nor can it ever be possible for the mirror to free itself from its draws. It is clear and evident that until a fire is kindled, the lamp will never be ignited. And unless the dross is blotted out from the face of the mirror, it can never represent the image of the sun, nor reflect its light and glory. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alvors. Jane, are you ready, please? Yes. It's my pleasure to introduce Ian Kluge, poet, playwright, philosophy scholar, and beloved teacher par excellence. He's joining us tonight from British Columbia with his exceptional white wife, Christy. Kirsty. He's published numerous articles and several books of poetry. He's a frequent presenter at conferences and at the Wilnet Institute. His talk, Baha'i Proofs for God, at the Institute's 20th anniversary commemorative series generated so much interest it overloaded the system's online capacity. His plays have been performed in Vancouver, Victoria, Prince George, and other communities throughout the North. And one has the intriguing title, The Gender Wars Trilogy. His heart, however, is in philosophy and awakening the philosophical thought within all of us. He found his true calling as a high school teacher. For 30 years, he developed a program to integrate philosophy into all the subjects he taught, including English, comparative civilizations, and world history. Ian based his teaching career on two principles. One, philosophy is everybody's business. And two, everyone, including teens, is a natural born philosopher, even if they don't know it. Ian believes that the Baha'i writings embed a logically coherent worldview that support Abdul Baha's, the son of the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, statement that in this age, the people of the world need the arguments of reason. So folks, get comfortable and prepare to engage in a new explanation, exploration of some of the great questions of man existence. Can we be good without God? Ian, we're all yours. Wow, how do I live up to that? Uh, <laughs> um, first of all, let me put everybody at rest. I'm not going to read everything that's shown on the slides. I simply have put the material there in case somebody wants the slides and they can actually see the process of reasoning I've used to get where I am and to reach the kind of conclusions. That, that I reach. The other thing is we're going to approach this topic from various angles. And so you're going to see some problems and some issues emerge again and again about the issue of can we be good without God? Um, before I begin though, I would like to be, I would like to show the, the second slide was the quote from Abdul Baha, which I think has done a lot to inspire my work. Uh, and what, what, are, what we're getting today is uh, really part of a book that I'm writing, actually a, a, probably a two volume slugger called The Baha'i Writing the Philosophical Approach, in which I try to present, uh, demonstrate that the Baha'i writings uh, contain a coherent, logically coherent and complete hierarchically structured view of reality and everything that includes in the practical world of ethics and, and everything else. The quote that I have from Abdul Baha, and it's the only long quote I will read, to me is just essential. If a religious belief and doctrine is at variance with reason, it proceeds from the limited mind of man and not from God. Therefore, it is unworthy of belief and not deserving of attention. The heart finds no rest in it and real faith is impossible. How can man believe that which he knows to be opposed to reason? Is this possible? Can the heart accept that which reason denies? And this is very important because it distinguishes the Baha'i writings right there from a wise quip from Mark Twain, who wants to find faith as believing what you know ain't so. And uh, 
that's that, that that is partly a problem in philosophical terms believing what you know ain't so is called fideism you simply believe as an act of will and i don't think the writings support that abdul baha links heartfelt assent and faith with rationality but also affirms the rationale that rationality is a necessary though not sufficient condition for faith and wholehearted confidence in the teachings and so hopefully that quote will help us to dispel this notion that used to be around when I first became a Baha'i in 1980, that there were head Baha'is and heart Baha'is and mystics and intellectuals. In the Baha'i writings, all of these things are fused together. And there's one thing I should add as well, which I didn't put in there, which is that rationality, although I can't get into that today, does not exclude what in philosophy is called other ways of knowing, such as intuition or tacit knowledge, which is, for an example of tacit knowledge, is the knowledge that a mechanic may have, basically in his physical body, in his hands. They just know what to do, and yet you could never quantify this knowledge. Um, there, it, it just doesn't fit certain parameters of knowledge, but nonetheless, it's all very real. Okay, one of the big questions is that, uh, and of course, I, I always got to say this, one of the th issues with philosophy is it used to be said, and I hope it's not being said anymore, this partial quote from Shoghi Effendi that philosophy is no good because it begins and ends in words. And the exact quote is, philosophy as you will study it and later teach it is certainly not one of the sciences that begins and ends in words. Fruitless excursions into metaphysical hair splitting is meant and not a sound branch of learning like philosophy. And we'll end it there. <laughs> The question is, can we be good without God is very frequently debated, and I'm sure comes up as often in your firesides as it does at the ones I have attended. Why do I need a religion to be a good person or a moral person? Um, aren't my ordinary good acts just good enough? And Baha'u'llah, in my understanding, and of course, this is all my understanding, disagrees with that principle. Uh, and if I could have slide number four up, please. Um, this is probably the, one of the most controversial quotations from Baha'u'llah, and we're going to unpack it today and to, and to see it and how other part, portions of the writing support it and to see why he comes to that conclusion. Know thou for a certainty that whosoever, whoso disbelieveth in God is neither trustworthy nor truthful. This indeed is the truth, an undoubted truth. He that acteth treacherously towards God will also act treacherously toward his king. Nothing whatever can deter such a man from evil. Nothing can hinder him from betraying his neighbor. Nothing can induce him to walk uprightly. And... Uh, this statement has been condemned even by, by Baha'is, I have to admit, as being divisive, uh, it's demeaning, it's contradictory to his own teachings, such as consort with all Baha'is with fellowship uh, and, and friendliness and, and, and so on and so forth. But we're going to see that there are other ways of looking at this quote. Uh, this statement does not mean that anybody should mistreat atheists or non-believers, but it does draw attention to the weak foundations of their moral beliefs. Uh, rationally, it, as we shall see again and again from different perspectives, all forms of atheism, and I will come to list some of them, um, suffer from a number of, of recurring weaknesses that a complete philosophy that's theistically based does not have. And one of these is the sub subjectivism. Uh, subjectivism mean, merely means that you become your own standard, your own feelings, whatever, become your own standard for judging moral actions. 
It's a little bit like my play, which is called The Supermarket of the Gods, in which people go out to a supermarket sh shopping for a god whom they like, who suits them, and they all come out carrying a mirror. And, and that is subjectivism. And that's just not a problem for religion. That's a problem. Subjectivism is a problem elsewhere, too, because it's linked to a bunch of other problems. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so um, this, you know, bring us to the question is, is, is this a good foundation for moral beliefs? More specifically, and I'm going to lead, connect this to another issue in the writings, is it wise and rational to rely on the moral, on morality of someone who does not feel gratitude or loyalty to the source of existence? Because Baha'u'llah gets right into that in, the, in that quotation. And the whole universe which makes his existence possible. If you can't show gratitude or loyalty to God, why would you rationally be expected always to show loyalty to a lesser being? If your morals are subjective, maybe other purely subjective and have no better grounding than uh, your, your belief in yourself, uh, what's wrong with, with career making or doing all of the other things that, that people do uh, that are not necessarily in line with the high ethics. Uh, now, I'm not saying that God, you know, God can show mercy to this deficiency, which may be rooted in ignorance or weakness, but it does not mean that believers should be naive with about the consequences of this belief. And there's a wonderful quote from, from the Bible, Matthew 10, I think it is, where Christ says, I release you or I allow you to go into the company of wolves, but be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. It's the wise as serpents. Know where this can go. Don't, be, don't necessarily be, be naive. The other problem is, of course, related to the Baha'i concept of justice which the Baha'i writing consistently, whether it's through Baha'u'llah, the Abdul Baha, or Shoghi Effendi, defined as giving everything is due. If you can't be just to God, if you can't give God his due, his recognition, um, at the very least, that throws a question mark under your ability, uh, your willingness, your commitment to do justice elsewhere. Uh, this is not necessarily good news, but it's just a basic fact of, of, of human nature. Um, so if we could have the next slide, please. And of course, and this relates to the business of goodness because a good action can't be unjust. And an unjust action cannot be good. And justice is a prerequisite for being good, which of course is why, you know, Baha'u'llah says, you know, the best beloved in my sight is, of all things, is justice. And this, once you start looking at this from the point of view of justice, then a whole bunch of other questions arise with what is good. Uh, how can we know what is due to each person if we don't know what their human nature is, which God knows. How do we know their, what's good short-term, long-term, spiritually, psychologically, physically? There may be a lot of things that are good physically, but that are not necessarily good spiritually or even socially. Um, I suppose I should give an example of, of, of that. Um, but... It is not always wise to allow teenagers to do what they want to do physically. And it's not always wise for their long-term development to pave the way for them to do these things. Um, sometimes you have to draw a line somewhere. And if that doesn't happen, then thing in negative development start happening in their character um, inevitably because they, the whole idea of 
they get this idea that you cannot, there are no lines for them. Okay, so uh, the knowledge of, of human nature, which comes from God, and the business of justice, of giving people what is their due, all come together underlying the conclusions about can we be good without God. Um, can we be good without God if we have a strictly incomplete or materialistic understanding of human nature? If you believe the soul is nothing, there is no soul, there is no spiritual nature, mind is brain, um, there is no immortality, um, from a Baha'i perspective, at least, you cannot fully know what is good for people, uh, or even for yourself for that matter. It's, remember, uh, you just don't have to be good to other people, you also have to be good to yourself in order to become a good human being. So if doing and being and doing good is only based on subjective, personal or collective beliefs, um, and not on an eternal transcendent, then there is no adequate knowledge of human nature. There are intellectual logical weaknesses, and there is no knowledge of human destiny and the role of uh, mankind's role in the cosmos, which are all things that take an important part in the Baha'i writings. And as one of the, the readings that started here, that started our session, uh, brought out about man, uh, mankind and his role in the cos cosmos. So you can't ultimately know what is really good for a person. If you, not many people would accept that you really know what's good to a person if you define a human being in a strictly materialist sense. Because in a strictly materialist sense, a human being is a complex of electrochemical processes. And that's all, and we'll see more about that, that, that later. And if that's all a human being is, if that's how you define them, and if you believe that's all they are, doing good to them becomes reduced to something else what's advantageous and what's advantageous is not necessarily what's good or what's convenient you start to use people or you have cleared the way to use people as or to view people as hindrances or assistance but in non-moral terms and that is exactly what happened in the 20th century and then my personal autobiography relates to this is what happened in, in both Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany, um, where people were no longer recognized as anything but electrochemical processes. So how do you build a moral on that? And we shall, we shall look at that later in more philosophical terms. Oh, next slide, please. Okay, so we have, to, I present some examples here of different forms of non-theist ethics of morality. In other words, theories that separate ethics, morals from morality and atheism, people who you know, basically they don't believe. And I provide some examples there. I'm sure you've all heard of the new atheists. Uh, there are other important atheist philosophers. You know, we could go into Nietzsche and God is dead. And, and all that kind of stuff, or the whole brook in the, in the early uh, 17th century and so on. But these are the ones who are currently around. Secular humanism, uh, both good authors, a good representative of secular humanism, non-theist existentialism, and you have Sartre and Camus. And if you, my recommendation is, if you really want to understand non-theist existentialism, a lot of non-theist thinking, you read Sartre's Being and Nothingness, and you read it carefully with a pencil and pen in hand to, to mark and cross-reference, because it is a very thoughtful work. I disagree with virtually all of it, but it is a very thoughtful work. Uh, Postmodernism, uh, which doesn't believe that there is such a thing as human nature, and that's a very popular concept in today's university. There is simply no such thing as human nature. In fact, 
asserting that there is such a thing as human nature is viewed as, and they use this word, fascism or totalitarianism, uh, because you are dictating to other people what they should be like. They even have problems with the concept of an underlying physical human nature, some of them. Um, and of course, Marxism is another form of uh, non-theism. Non and uh, I don't think any of these names there are new to anybody. The person I would encourage people to read if you want to understand what's going on in the United States and in the West now, it would be Friedrich Engels, Marx's sidekick. He is really the social prophet in many ways of virtually everything we see today. In fact, I see very little today. I grew up in a Marxist Leninist family, so this is this is home territory to me. Uh, there is very little happening today that I can't find in Engels first. Uh, it's it's that simple. And then, of course, agnostics are those who don't know whether there is a God, and that creates its own problems for ethics and being good. And apatheism, which is, I don't care, which is probably a fairly significant portion of the human population nowadays. Uh, you know, do you need God to be good? Yeah, well, who cares? I just do what I'm going to do, which is a form of subjectivism, of course. Okay, uh, next slide, please, number eight. So we're going to explore these ideas. Having had this little rundown, we're going to explore these ideas in, in, in uh, more philosophical detail under four headings, persuasion, metaphysics, and the intrinsic limits of science, which Abdul Baha recognizes and which the writings recognize, um, not talked about very often, but definitely there and important, uh, human nature, and then I have a list of five or six problems that often come up uh, in relationship to secular ethics. So we'll start with persuasion. And that, of course, be, relates to progressive revelation, because Abdul Baha says, in this age, people need the arguments of reason. So um, our, Ab Abdul Baha is saying something very particular about our time and what people in our time to need to be persuaded. And of course, I think we all recognize that if you, are, if you aren't persuaded of ethics, of a, an ethical belief, but are forced to it, it's not really an ethical belief. Uh, you're simply capitulating to superior force. And that superior force can be violent or it can be social pressure. Uh, we certainly see a lot of that nowadays. Uh, there are a lot of forms in which it can be family pressure. Um, it, it can be all sorts of things. But unless you are ethics which do not come freely are not genuine ethics. Uh, and Abdul Baha says that. I at one time I thought I had a quote in there about that, but I don't seem to anymore. And persuasion works best by reason because, as Abdul Baha says, the foundations of religion are reasonable. And then he adds, if religion were contrary to logical reason, then it would cease to be religion and be merely a tradition. And by tradition, of course, here he means it's simply something passed on from one member of a family or one member of one member in society to somebody else, but nobody really understands it. Why do we do it that way? Because we've always done it that way. And there are times when that works, but given our particular time in the in progressive revelation, Abdul Bahat, at least as I read him, is indicating that is no longer a satisfactory way of doing business. Um, okay. One of the things, so, so uh, next page, please. Oh, I guess page, whoops, did I skip the page here? No, I, I'm fine. Uh, next page, please. It's, uh, I think it's page 10. It would be the next one. One of the things that 
reason helps provide is coherence. In other words, we can reason our way from one point, one logical statement or one philosophical statement to another in a hierarchical order like Russian dolls. I have an article coming out in a book on the philosophy of Abdul Baha from Cambridge University in which I show how everything in the Baha'i writings uh, and Abdul Baha's philosophy grows out of the teaching of emanation and Baha'i metaphysics. In other words, the whole system is vertically integrated. Everything logically, the, the consequences logically come out from that. And that's philosophical coherence. And the other, of course, is it's got to satisfy the principle of sufficient reasoning. And this principle of sufficient reasoning is very simple. Science is based on it. It simply says that an explanation must be adequate. It must be a causal explanation has to fully explain an event in terms of what it came before it and what comes after it and why. Uh, and that's an interesting argument you can have with atheists because materialism has a really hard time. Materialist theories about cosmology have a really hard time coming up with an answer that satisfies the principle of sufficient reasoning. They all wind up getting caught in an infinite regress. Uh, and, and in science, an infinite regress is the kiss of death. And Abdul Baha, Bill Hatcher and I used to argue about this, Abdul Baha specifically rejects the concept of a infinite regress. He says it is absurd. And the word absurd is his word in some answered questions. So knowledge, so ultimately we see that knowledge of human nature gives power of persuasion because it supports <laughs> legitimate authority. In other words, you don't have authority coming from the point of a gun as or barrel of a gun as Mao Zedong says but because you have legitimate authority is based on knowledge. God and only God has the knowledge about human nature, its future, its past, its hidden intricacies uh, in order to decree through his manifestations what is good. And if knowledge isn't, and if power is made not based on legitimate knowledge, true knowledge, it becomes arbitrary and despotic. And people recognize that. That's why subjectivism doesn't work in practice because everybody knows human beings are fallible. Who knows what they're going to believe uh, or and why? So why should I believe them? So legitimate authority is very important. Uh, and so you, and we practice that in every day, in every day, you go to your doc, your doctor has legitimate authority as far as we're concerned, because our doctor, at least supposedly knows and his knowledge or her knowledge gives them the authority to say, this is the medication you need to take, or this is the procedure you need to have. We allow surgeons to be, uh, to operate on us. And I've had two major operations in the last two and a half years uh, because they know what they're doing inside of, inside of us. And so legitimate authority is very important. And this is where non-theist theories of morals get into real trouble. Where is the legitimate of authority? And we'll talk about God and all that, that later. And of course, ultimately power. Uh, if legitimate authority doesn't have power, it's, it's just an, it degenerate. It just becomes another opinion that's out there. And the power to dictate or to create human nature as it is comes from God, from a theist point of view. It even comes from nature, the natural evolutionary process from a non-theist point of view. But the people who do not have the power to dictate human nature are human beings. Whether you're in, whether you're a theist or a non-theist, this is a, uh, this is part of the problem in this idea, the postmodern idea, again, uh, that there is no such thing as human nature and that we can change human nature by changing words by which we describe things and so on and so forth. Or that we can create human nature 
And that has had, again, coming from Eastern European background, that has had very, you know, the, the, the Soviets tried to create the new Soviet man, they called him. Um, they wanted to change human nature. Engels wanted to change human nature. Uh, he wanted to break the bond between mothers and children, he said, for example, or parents and children. Uh, the, the better, more social, human, socialized human beings would not recognize their children as property or that they somehow have rights over them. That's how he put it. Uh, but this idea that, that humans somehow have control over human nature has, has led to very bad practical results. Uh, okay, the next page, page 11. Human nature also affects morality because moral rules that violate human nature do not work in the long run. In the short run, you might make them work by force, by persuasion, whatever. But in the long run, human nature will exert itself and return to the way a theist would say God created it, a non-theist would say the way nature evolution cre created us. Um, and human nature requires certain responses and giving the correct harmonizing response is part of what is being, what is meant by being good. Uh, if, if, if a moral teaching violates human nature, it has a problem with being good because it violates human nature. Uh, that's why some of these idealistic communities don't last very long. I saw that personally. I spent a lot of time in, you wouldn't know there, but in the Kootenays in British Columbia, which was an interior filled with communes uh, of very idealistic people. I don't fault their idealism at all. They, they tried very hard to reshape themselves. None, none of them worked. And a lot of them disintegrated in violence simply because they were trying to do things that were not natural to human beings, such as, for example, the concept of marriage and uh, marital exclusivity and so on. These things have all been tried, but they have historically have not worked very well. And of course, the writings don't uh, support that with the Shoghi Effendi's wonderful term, the eternal verities. The manifestations of God teach the eternal verities. There are certain truths that run through moral truths that run through every religion and every dispensation. And they may be practiced and adapted to different cultural situations. Those cultural situations will pass. But the basic moral truth, the oneness of human nature, and the eternal verities will remain. And they, too, determine what is good. And that is why it is important to listen to the manifestations, because they all agree on these basic things about what these eternal verities are and what constitutes good for human nature. Uh, of course, there are deviations, and I'll deal with that later, that, but that's because humans have free will. Okay, so unless the, the moral teachings, the good has to harmonize with the inter eternal verities. Uh, moral teachings require a transcendent for a number of reasons based on the one of these is the transcendent, and that's the term I use for God, because God in philosophy and in theology comes with so much baggage that uh, and um, prejudices and feelings that I've adopted the term the transcendent from the German existential philosopher Karl Jasper who's another person I highly recommend reading. Um, God is omnipotent. And of course, when it comes to, in other words, God has the knowledge and the legitimate authority and no one can, no external power or force 
can override his authority about what is human nature. Humans will not change human nature. Human nature will evolve because it, we will, in progressive revelation, we will continuously actualize more and more of our hidden potentials. And some of these, I think, are pretty amazing. But I mean, that, that's just my own thoughts about what, where the human race is going. But uh, we should all imagine, understand that we all have hidden potentials as individuals and as a species. Um, the, the development of a global mind, so to speak, uh, what Taylor Deschardins called the newosphere, the mind sphere above the, uh, the physical reality of the world. That opens up all sorts of new potentials for humans to actualize and make some developments such as the elimination of war, which under current circumstances seems like a pretty far stretch at best, uh, an actual possibility. Uh, something to be considered a, a rational possibility, something that a rational person can say, yeah, I can, I can accept that, or I can, I could be open to questioning, thinking about that. And that's the whole purpose of my, my book and my philosophical works. I'm not out to prove all the other beliefs are false. I'm out to show that it is possible to be a rational, modern human being in the 21st century and be a thinking Baha'i. Uh, and to adopt the Baha'i faith, that it is a truly rational choice for people given this particular state, uh, stage of human evolution. The transcendent, of course, is omnipresent, and that's, that's pretty, pretty uh, standard. And of course, it is omniscient. Oh, there's one more thing I should add about omnipotent. People will get into discussions. Well, an omnipotent God, and they define God omnipotent as doing anything. No, omnipotence means that there is no external power that can force God to do anything. He has more power over all other things. This does not mean necessarily God can overcome his own goodness and become diabolically evil. And you get all these, these little questions, can God make a stone heavier than himself? Or can God create two mountains without a valley between them? Uh, and the, the, there used to be a term for this kind of stuff in uh, these kind of ideas in, in Victorian literature. And it's, it's, uh, I recommend it. It's, they called it village atheism. The guy who liked to shock the local villagers with these questions. But if you analyze them logically, you discover they don't mean anything. If God could really make square circles, how could we human beings know it? We couldn't even recognize the fact that he's done that because we're, we're not made that way. So it's a kind of a useless question. It doesn't get you anywhere. It is truly beginning and ending in words. Uh, and, and, and that's where it goes. And of course, the transcendent is omniscient because it's created everything. And if it's created everything, it has to know whatever is involved in its creation. So if we go to page 12, I'm not going to go through all of these, but these, these are important. The deficiencies of non-theist ethics. They hear other places where people go for their ethics, but they all suffer, suffer from the same weaknesses I've already mentioned, subjectivism, infinite regresses, relativism, and at the very worst, nihilism. Not that all non-theists are nihilists, but at its very worst development. Uh, they try to base their idea on human rights. We are human and so we have rights. Yeah, well, why? Why does a set of electrochemical processes have rights inherently. There's nothing in the whole concept of electrochemical processes that says we have rights. So you can't base your rights on that. You have to import something from the outside. Back to subjectivism. Feelings. This was, <coughs> excuse me. This was the great 
philosopher Hume, who said all morals is nothing but sympathy. Well, there have been some pretty uncomplimentary things said about sympathy, but I don't think uh, I'll say them. But again, it doesn't, feeling sorry for somebody doesn't necessarily mean that what you're intending to do to them or for them is good. Letting a criminal go because you feel sorry for them is not necessarily doing that person any real good because good has to meet genuine needs. And the needs of a, of a criminal are to, to learn to be a member of society, to learn to think about others and not just him or herself, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, good, good faith, in other words, we are responsible, this is from Sartre's existentialism, we are willing to take responsibility for our actions. Well, that's a very poor basis for morals. I'm sure you all know who Josef Mengele was, the angel of death at Auschwitz, the doctor who did the experiments on people. To his life, to his, the day of his death in 1974 or 75, to his own son, he said, I take full responsibility for what I did because I thought it was right and I still think it's right. So he was perfectly willing to take responsibility. The willing, the, uh, you know, there, there are criminals who are quite willing to take responsibility um, for their actions. I taught one. I actually taught a kid who became a contract killer. Out of all my many thousands of students, he's the only one I would describe as he's probably really, really bad deep inside. Uh, he, was, he never denied that to his parents. I knew his parents, so I know what he was saying. So there's political commands that's from Hobbes, man-made ideologies. You can base your morals on them. You can base them on science, try to. We'll see in a few minutes that why that doesn't work. Societal advantage, nicer preferences. That's one of the favorite ones nowadays with a, with a philosopher called Kyle Nielsen, Kai Nielsen, which boils down to, I think some of us are old enough to remember the little Abner cartoons. Uh, where Mammy Yoakum says, good is better than evil because it's nicer. Well, it's a good sentiment, I, I agree, but it doesn't provide the logical foundation for anything. Okay, next page then. Again, I've, I'm, I'm going to go through these more quickly. Uh, I've talked about subjectivism. Uh, there is no moral standard uh, outside of yourself. And without an absolute moral standard, you ultimately have subjectivism and relativism. Uh, and I'll race ahead here a little bit. Uh, I, I have invented something that I call the Teresa, Mother Teresa Joseph Mengele test. You all know I've already mentioned Joseph Mengele. Uh, the angel of death at Auschwitz. If your moral system can't give an absolute difference between the acts of Mother Teresa and the acts of Joseph Mengele, your moral system has a real problem. It's relativist and subjectivist, and that means all moral opinions boil down to your personal say-so uh, and not, nothing more. Uh, I'm sure you all know who Mother Teresa was. Uh, relativism, there are no absolute moral laws. And this is not what the Baha'i faith teaches. That's why Baha'u'llah says, and I, I'm going to jump down here a little bit, to act like the beasts of the field is unworthy of man. Those virtues that befit his dignity are forbearance, mercy, compassion, loving kindness toward all the peoples of the earth. In other words, there are certain moral standards that are absolute, and there are individuals who do not meet those standards, and there are societies that do not meet those standards. 
you know, and we can talk about to what degree and so on and so forth. And that's an important part of societal debate. And of course, the eternal verities are also the absolute standards that, that Albert Baha has. Um, and the, next page, please. We've already talked about human nature. Uh, the lack of, I want to give an example of what is an infinite regress. An infinite regress in ethics is when there is no final conclusion except what we subjectively choose. So somebody says stealing is morally wrong. You ask why? Well, because society says so. Why does that make it right? Why should I care? Because society finds it advantageous. Why should I care? I'm worried about me. Because we are, you are disrespecting a person. Why should I respect one electrochemical process over another? And so on and so forth. You can just keep these infinite regress questions for non-theist ethics going forever. Uh, in other words, they come to no actual <laughs> conclusion. And that is the problem. Go on to the next page there, uh, please. Uh, in other words, subject, I'm just gonna skip a lot of these because I don't think we, I need to read all these. Ethical, ethical subjectivism is dangerous because they have no internal breaks. There is no internal princi uh, principle inside them to say, that's wrong, you can't do that. that. That crosses a line. There is no absolute line anymore. And without that, you can fudge anything. We all know, you know, statistics are the perfect example of scientific fudging. I, I took a, a senior course in statistics one year in which the prof showed as a joke how he can relate the number of telephone poles in Punjab province in India to the birth rate in Canada, <laughs> just by fudging definitions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, the importance of an absolute standard is practically very important. Uh, the hospital scenario is, is one that really shows, it's, it's a mental ex, uh, experiment in what's called experimental philosophy. You have five people, each one of whom needs a different organ transplant. And in comes a young man, with a broken leg, and I think you've already figured this out. So the surgeon thinks, young man, broken leg, I can save five people by using the organs from one. And that's the greater good for the greater number. That's the greatest, great utilitarian principle of good. Why wouldn't I? And without an absolute moral principle, such as the sanctity of human life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you would find yourself running a long way, very hard to find an answer why you wouldn't. In practice, of course, no, nobody asks that question, thank goodness. But the problem, it illustrates the problem with non-theist ethics. Okay, I'm going to skip over to page 16 and I'm going to summarize some of this because I don't want to go on too much, too, too longer. Um, number two, the limitations of science. Um, the, the problem, first of all, I'd like to point out Abdul Baha's quote, science cannot cure the ills of the body politic. Science cannot create amnity and fellowship in human hearts. Neither can patriotism and racial allegiance affect a remedy. The, limit, the basic limitation in science, which is one that is still debated in modern philosophy of science, and I've taught philosophy of science for BIHE, is called Hume's guillotine. And Hume's guillotine is based on a very simple principle. I'll use an example to illustrate it. Just because it's a fact that Jenny always cooked supper does not mean there is a moral obligation for Jenny to always cook supper. In other words, a, pre, a, descript, a description of an event cannot 
physical event cannot bring us a prescription about what should be done. Um, and this is known as Hume's guillotine. So next, next page there. In other words, what Hume's guillotine leads to is very simply, you cannot find value in moral values in nature. There is no possible experiment you can, we have done or that can, could conceivably do that shows that nature makes a moral judgment about anything. And this is, of course, is the problem of basing morals on nature. And that is exactly why the Baha'i writings reject that. That's why Abdul Baha says, for a man to behave like a beast, you know, a lot of people will argue that some whatever human behaviors are okay because animals do them. And the Baha'i answer is, yeah, well, we're not animals. What is natural to an animal, given its nature, is not natural or appropriate to a human being, given our nature. And you, you simply can't find a way to bridge that gap from a fact of nature. The fact that water flows downhill has no moral significance. You could read some into it, but in itself, no scientific experiment can show that there's any moral hidden in that fact. Science limits itself very simply to think to, in, to phenomena that are quantifiable, that are physical or material, that are physically observable, repeatable by others, falsifiable and are testable and predictable. And you cannot find morals anywhere in the description of the scientific method or what it takes to be considered scientific. So basing morals on nature, on science, and a guy named uh, Sam Harris has written a very good book. I recommend you read it. I always recommend you read the people you disagree with called The Moral Landscape, How Science Can Shape Our uh, our, our moral nature. Science can tell us a lot of things that are advantageous or even the best practices. It can tell us a whole lot of factual information, but science is not geared to have moral information. <clears throat> that doesn't mean we can't take science into account or the, the discoveries of science. You know, uh, if somebody has a bad heart, we have to take into account our moral decisions about whether or not they should get an operation, have to take into account that we can do heart transplants. But the fact that we can do heart transplants is not in itself a moral obligation to do them. That has to come from somewhere else. That has to be the important. So, oh, listen, I'm trying to get this, this. And because it has to be imported, this is page 19, a, a theory of ethics based on science can't be complete and it is not in itself fully rational and it can't be coherent because it has to import standards from somewhere else. And therefore, it violates the most fundamental principle of science, which is the principle of sufficient reason, which namely, it does not give an adequate explanation of what we're dealing with, of what we want to do. Okay, page 20. An inconvenient fact. Oh, I wrote originally an inconvenient truth about human nature. Bottom line is very simple. We have never, ever encountered any society or culture that does not recognize the existence of a transcendent or God or base its morality on that. In other words, there's a need, seems to be a human need. Whether or not there is God or not is a different issue, but there seems to be a human need for a transcendent. And we've already pointed out some of those reasons to make power legitimate, to make authority legitimate. And science, uh, in the secular age, of course, we have a lot of ersatz or substitute religion. I'm sure you've all noticed this. Notice that people say, 
uh, in, in a time when everybody says, I don't believe in God or in, in any spirits, movies about the supernatural and people with supernatural abilities like Greek gods or Indian gods are, are proliferating. Uh, we have super girl on TV uh, and people who don't seem to be able to give a thought about God or the possibility of taking responsibility uh, are scared spitless by going to movies about demonic possession. There, it's one of my profs. Um, I should have uh, given him, cited him. Said a Jesuit said something very wise once. Oh, I was one of those kids who went to a Catholic university to rebel against his parents. Uh, um, that, that's, that's sort of funny, given it was a Marxist-Leninist household. Uh, the, the prof said, man will have religion. It may be the religion of God or the religion of the devil, but man will have religion. And you have all sorts of, in this century, the last century, we've seen all sorts of pseudo-religions or ersatz religions come out, uh, you know, the, 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 the master race, uh, the, 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 the proletariat, uh, the, you know, the, the upper wide class, and all sorts, you know, dictators who take on these transcendent powers. And of course, they use the machinery of state to enforce this. But the bottom line is, you are still looking for something that is basically more than what human beings are uh, as your source of authority. You know, Mao's little red book. I don't know if any of you have ever read it. I have. I've also read Ayatollah Khomeini's green book, which is, which is something to read. Um, humans, human being, and the reason is simple. Human beings don't recognize human beings recognize the fallibility of other human beings and so for them to get moral authenticity uh they look to something that is more than human transcendent in other words as i say on page 21 we're stuck with god whether we like it or not uh, as a necessary presupposition as manuel kant said kant was a, is the father of modern philosophy along with Descartes, and Kant showed how none of the logical proofs of God are correct. He's wrong, by the way. And Abdul Baha points out that there are, we can prove the existence of God. Uh, but then he turns around later and he says in another book, yeah, but you need God as a ground for your morals, as a regulative principle. So, you know, uh, he kicked God out the front door, so to speak, and let him in through the back window. Uh, and that's a lot of uh, what happens. Okay, now we get to the page 22. We get to another question that often comes up in this God, can we be good without God uh, issue is, why does belief in God make a psychological difference? And the very answer is precisely what we find in the writings and all religions teach this in some way or another, that we examine ourselves, that we take ourselves to account every night. As Baha'u'llah says, in other words, that we establish a base of self-criticism. One of the requirements for moral progress is that we don't believe everything we think, which is, which is a non-reflective, non-self-critical way of being, that we look at ourselves from another perspective, set before thine eyes, God's unerring balance, and as one standing in his presence, weigh in that balance thine activities every day, says Baha'u'llah. In other words, this too helps to avoid subjectivism. And subjectivism is the beginning of that road uh, 
that leads to all of the other problems that occur with non-theist ethics, our attempts to create non-theist ethics. In other words, it's not non-theist ethics are basically, from a, a logical point of view, not very viable. That doesn't mean they're evil necessary or anything like that. It's, it's not a moral condemnation because I'm not doing moral condemnation. What I am doing is showing where there are logical, philosophical problems and because either there's something wrong in the way you're thinking about them or there is a problem with the consequences. You choose in the end what, what, you, what you want to do. So, in, in, and because of human nature, we can easily fall prey to our lower animal nature. And that is exactly what, what his, history is. What do, you, what do you think, you know, for example, Mao's statement, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun is. It says might makes right. And the Soviets, the Nazis, or fascia, they're all, they all had the same, they were all spreading the same idea, but there was nothing self-critical about it. And we simply allow our subjectivity to guide us to wherever we want to go without self-questioning and self-reflection. Okay. Um, um, okay, so I think I'm going to skip that to page 23, and I'm going to very quickly go through five questions, and then let's wait and see what happens. Um, five secular objections. Um, that's page 23. It's on there. Um, one of the questions people ask, well, what difference does it make whether... You know, we, we since we can't prove God exists, why why bother? And which is a very good question. There, there. In in fact, it's it's crucial. But when you examine the kind of knowledge that science can give us and does give us about reality quantifiable, et cetera, et cetera, the stuff that I listed before, and all of the things that are, have to be left out, you can't come to an abs... It, it's very questionable that saying, because we can't prove that God exists, which I, I disagree with, and there are some, but that's a different topic. It, science leaves out too much. It leaves out tacit knowledge. It leaves out... In other words, experiential knowledge. There is some knowledge science can give you. As I used to say to my high school students, you know, you can read all the scientific studies and books and articles written about a first kiss. But until you've had one, you don't have a clue uh, what that can do or mean to you. There is lots of knowledge that is beyond the ability. Science can give us all of the electrochemical readouts, and it's all been done. Kinsey and his follower, it's, it's all been done. Nothing new there. But all those books won't tell you what your first kiss from someone you really like is going to be like and what it's going to do to you. There are just limits. And to base your uh, a rejection of God and transcendent ethics on that is, I would say, at the very least, extremely risky. You might be wiser in looking at the fact that we have, that all human beings in all cultures have had a belief in God, a transcendent, and uh, base their morals on it. Uh, at this point, the voice of human experience and history comes, comes into the fore. This is not a put down of science. Abdul Baha, by the way, has a perfect way of uniting science and religion, but that's a, another topic that, that uh, and, it, and it's all in some answered questions. Uh, if you know, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's not a very good counter answer considering how much scientific knowledge and a logical proofs of God leave out. Uh, the second objection is the choice to believe in a transcendent is also purely subjective or arbitrary. By itself, and 
in the moment, that may be, but there are two things to remember. One, not all, pro not all preferences lead to the same logical conclusions. If your preference for ethics does not allow you to distinguish between the acts of Mother Teresa and the acts of Joseph Mengele, maybe that's a consequence you'd want to consider. Uh, if that's what you really, if you really want to go down that road. Uh, and again, that becomes a decision for the individual. And of course, I, 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 as I've already just explained in the previous section, given how much we can't know and how much knowledge comes through other ways, that's not a terribly good, good argument. Um, do our motives for good act, next page, page is page 24, do our motives for good actions make any difference? Um, that'll be the next page. Um, as individuals, when we can look at our acts one-off, probably not. You know, if whether a, a person, the person who gives a homeless man a sandwich is an atheist or a believer makes virtually very little, if any, difference at that moment. But when you consider the fact that human beings live in societies, and societies have to play, do a, have to rely to a great deal on human motives and trust for human motives, we're back to Baha'u'llah's first initial statement, then motives matter a great deal. You know, think about people who go through red lights. <laughs> Again, I like to bring things down to the every, everyday level. I, go, I don't go through red lights for two reasons. One, I know it's illegal and I can't afford the ticket. But even worse, I don't want to have to wear this for the rest of my life in the next world that I actually risked somebody else's life, never mind my own, that I put somebody else's life in danger for absolutely no reason. And that's not doing good. And so that the business of motives me means a great deal in the long run and in a social context. The next one is, uh, I think it's, uh, yes, I, I like this. The numbers, my numbering system is a little crazy here because I added something. Um, I, I love this one because people who say, well, you shouldn't be good because you're scared of God. You should be good because you want to do good for its own sake, which is really a way of saying you shouldn't be good because you want to be held responsible for your actions. You should be good just because you want to be good, which is subjectivism. In other words, it's just a way to escape having to take responsibility for your actions. That's, that's what the life in the next world means. That's, that's what keeps a lot of people good. And I propose a dilemma for people who... who uh, who advocates this here, they have a choice. <clears throat> a man refrains from murdering his robbery victim because he believes in God, despite the lack of evident proof, and he fears God's punishment. Which would you rather have? Or um, he prefers to rely on his own subjective moral preferences, does not fear God's punishment, and commits his murder to eliminate a witness. Which would you rather have? And even on the most rational, non-theistic basis, you got to admit it's better that the guy is scared spitless of God and the Abha kingdom than it is to go ahead and say, well, I'm going to do it my way, to quote Frank Sinatra, and commit the murder. So even for non-theists, theism and theistic belief becomes a more rational choice. And another argument is, I think it's on the next page, uh, history shows that evil, uh, belief in God hasn't prevented people from doing evil actions. That's, that's very true. Um, 
but you've got to look at it in a historical perspective. In other words, from the perspective of progressive revelation, what is good in looking after, for example, in looking after your neighbor in a million BC, when human beings are highly fragmented into groups, and what is truly good in a world where everybody can communicate with everybody else are two different things. They are expressed in two different ways. The principle underlying them may be the same. The best example of, I give of that, of the, the change of will, is what I saw when the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia in 1968. The Russian army and Air Force were able to put down an entire tank division into the center of Prague in a matter of 12 hours. Hundreds of tanks, heavy tanks. The planes just came down. They each contained two or three tanks. They'd floored the flap. As the planes started taxiing for takeoff already, the tanks drove out. They split left and right, and they did that overnight. Two years later, the world was telling us we couldn't deliver food aid to the heights of Ethiopia because they were inaccessible by air. No, there was no problem with getting the food there. The will wasn't there. The desire wasn't there. Because being good to people in one situation doesn't always manifest in the same way as being good to others. And so we have to look at this fact that the unification of the whole of mankind had to go through stages of, you know, he says there, the unity of family, tribe, city, states, and so on from, from Shoghi Effendi. So yes, People did do more horrible things in the past, but those were under different conditions. That only matters if you don't look at the evolution or the progress of humankind. And that changes the picture somewhat. If you want to see what non-theist regimes can do, Try looking at Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's not exactly an advertisement for non-theism as well. And I, I'm sorry, it's my, my roots. They, they do come to the fore and those things do matter. Um, and we have to learn. That's what Abdul Baha says, and that's the next slide. We're almost at the end. The superior, and this, this, this really bothers some Baha'is, I know this, the superiority of the present in relationship to the past consists in this, that the present can take over and adopt as a model many things which have been tried and tested, and the great benefits of which have been demonstrated in the past, and that it can make its new discoveries and by these augment its valuable inheritance. In other words, there is progress in history. And that progress has to be taken into account when we looking at, look at the, uh, the actions, the moral actions of people in the past. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip objective five because I've uh, objection five because I've already uh, spoken them all. So that'll that'll be. So my conclusion is is very simple. Uh, the evidence we've presented strongly suggests that the idea of being good without God is not realistic, not a practical goal that may work as long as only a relatively small number of people pursue it. However, there is no evidence that it can and actually has been successfully applied at any nation in the past. Even states that are officially atheists find themselves devoting resources and efforts and secular ethics, good without God, but they're not practical in the end. Uh, and then th that's my, and Abdul Baha has the final say here, uh, next page, and he reminds us, we must speak only of that which is practically feasible in the world. There is indeed an abundance of lofty ideals and sentiments that cannot be put into practice. Therefore, we must confine ourselves to that which is practical. And that's all the quotations here from some answered questions, by the way, are from the new edition, not from the older edition of the past. And, and that's it. It's, it, good without God 
has theoretical problems and it has enormous practical problems. I leave it there. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, I have to say that I have been admiring this gentleman for many, many years, uh, even though I haven't had physical contact or discussion with him. But uh, whenever he would write something in this site that I belong to, and he is part of it, I would pay very much attention. In fact, uh, I admire you, Ian, uh, Ian, for your courage to taking such a really, really difficult topic and discuss it and bringing it to the to the situation that I can understand, you know, a little bit about it and admire that very much. In fact, uh, I wanted to share with you, uh, with the audience, I mean, you know that they ask Albert Einstein that what is the purpose of life? He said about, uh, forget about purpose of life, the most insignificant things. If you wanted to know what is the purpose of the most insignificant thing in existence, uh, in order to answer that, you have to be religious. And that means there is a ramification in everything that we do. And uh, really, I, I can't tell you how much I admire, and I'm looking forward to your books. Now to see that in a complete form, you know, that I can sit and read and read again and admire that. Thanks again, without anything, I say, I, I can't tell more really. I, I'll get excited. But the Alex, thank, uh, thanks again, Ian. And I'll thank be touch with you more, really. Uh, Alex, you're on. <laughs> thank you, Ian. And uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you for calling attention to some of the lesser known theories like postmodernism, uh, as well as the more well known <laughs> philosophies like Marxism, uh, that for the last decade or two have really taken root in the US university system. Uh, am I correct in understanding that one of your uh, the main takeaways from each of these philosophies uh, is that they do not have a foundational basis without first looking to religion to su supply the reason for their existence or humanity's existence uh, or humanity's <laughs> needs for irrevocable rights? Yeah, basically, yes. So there, the, my my presentation is is two pronged. Uh, maybe I should have made that. Clear. One is it is very it is impossible to have a complete theory of morals without a religious basis. And by a complete theory, I mean a theory or a belief system that contains within itself all the concepts and ideas necessary to answer the questions that it raises without having to import ideas, standards, morals from other outside considerations. Now, some people might think that's very elevated or hoity-toity or whatever, but it's not because History shows that sooner or later, these incompletenesses, these problems, these chickens come to roost. And Malcolm, we're, that. we're seeing that already, I think, in the Western world. And as Alex mentioned in the, in the uh, popularity of postmodernism and Marxism uh, or forms of Marxism, and they are out there. They're, they're, there is no two ways about it. Uh, I haven't heard anything yet from any of these people, including a lot of the feminists, that I couldn't relate back to Karl Marx. My father was a hardcore Marxist from Europe. He just didn't know Marx slogans. He knew Marx and Engels. And I have to say in all honor of him, after 40 years of arguing and talking with him, he finally became a Baha'i of all things. So I always use that as a standard to say that uh, if my dad can become a Baha'i, <laughs> you know, I used to grow up hearing, you know, we'll have a better world when we strangle the last capitalist with the guts of the last priest. Uh, you know, that's that's the sort of mood it was, but it was very, very intellectual. And 
these chickens, these bad chickens come home to roost and it's important to be aware of them. Postmodernism started in the university level with people saying there is no such thing as truth. Nobody knows the truth in anything. The Baha'i writings are sometimes interpreted by some Baha'is like that, but I, I think that doesn't, that interpretation doesn't fly, at least not from my perspective and not logically. But from no truth, you went to no human nature. And from no human nature, you went to, what is it now, 32, 38, 39, 70 sexes? Biological sexes? I'm not trying to revort, raise the issue of gender versus sex. But when you have no human nature, then you also get the, the idea that you can reshape it any way you want. And that's exactly the fundamental principles underlying Marxism and postmodernism and fascism, that we can make human beings into any shape we want, whether you're nature or I would say God, has nothing to say about it. And I think that is very dangerous. And we're seeing that now. Mm. Thank you. Ian. I'm sorry, did that answer your question? Yeah, very much so. And I know we're getting late uh, into the evening here. So I'll just I'll look to Al Boris to ask our final question for the evening. Oh, I'm Al sorry, Boris. I didn't realize. I'm, I'm, I'm up for longer if you guys are. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Al Boris. Albors, you have to unmute uh, whoops. yourself. Uh, sorry, Albors. Uh, whoops. All right, try now, Albors. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Here we go. Yes. Um, Ian, thank you so much for this. This is absolutely fascinating. On your last point um, to the previous question that Alex has posed, uh, you mentioned that you know a lot of these philosophies and even the Baha'i writings can be interpreted that you know, nobody really knows the truth or, or there is no truth, um, or at the very least, nobody knows it. Uh, and, and that principle is uh, kind of hand in hand with the idea that there's a number of religious and, and secular philosophies that hold absolute morality is impossible in an information deficit. Um, when you take these two principles together, in my mind, I come to the conclusion that since so many of the Baha'i writings remain untranslated uh, and, and some of them have been lost at the present time, is it possible to uh, decipher the, by, by the way that the faith describes it, an absolute morality or an absolute kind of Baha'i ethics, if you will? Um, and if it is, is there anything particularly important about the texts which we have and have been translated and what they mean for that quote unquote Baha'i ethics? Well, there are, I hear two questions. The first about the truth. Of course, the Baha'i writings believe that there are absolute truths about morality. That's the whole point of eternal verities. Secondly, the first principle of the Baha'i writings is the unfettered investigation of truth. In other words, truth does exist. The danger of people, the Baha'is who interpret it as if we can't know, go away. It's not that they're necessarily wrong completely, but they go too far. We can't know everything, but with the guidance of God and the Holy Spirit, which I and I, my interpretation of the Holy Spirit is is the 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 instrument that initiates the manifestation, who initiates a, a, a huge paradigm shift, and we, that's a, a, again another topic. Uh, but there are <coughs> things we can know. Um, the Baha'i writings never question that the Earth goes around the Sun, and so there is, there is some factual, absolute knowledge uh, that spring follows winter. And secondly, uh, again, with the eternal verities, 
that there are, because human nature is one, and the Baha, and Abdul Baha says specifically in many places, human nature has not changed throughout evolution. Man has always been man. Uh, humans have always been human. We are not descended from animals. And there is a very logical way of reconciling that with, with modern uh, evolutionary theory. Uh, it, it, it's really a ma matter of interpretation. So the, the idea that there isn't truth is, and we can't know any part of it or all of it. You see, there's a difference between knowing and a part of the truth and all of it uh, is dangerous because it then means we can basically tell or any narrative as they say nowadays, we like. And all narratives are equal, and they're not. Is the narrative that Mother Teresa told herself equal, equivalent, morally equivalent to the narrative Joseph Mengele told himself? I would think if you if you think think so, I, I we could spend the rest of the year dealing with the questions that arise out of that. It's not an it's not an easy choice because it raises so many other practical addition, practical problems, and that's the other side of it. Theoretically, there's a problem with the idea that there is no truth and we can't know it. But the Baha'i writings don't say that. They say the truth is known through evolutionary stages especially the moral truth. Scientific truth is, is a different issue, but their interest, the writings are interested in moral truth because it's as moral beings that we live in society. And that's where the center of consideration has to be. I don't know, did I answer your question? It may be. Albert, again, you are muted anyway. Uh, but that's okay. I'm sorry uh, about that. I can't unmute myself. But yes, that's a, a perfect answer. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. Thank you again, uh, Alex. Uh, is that the last uh, question that we can go to the next session? Yep. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. And we are about 10 minutes uh, above our time. Caroline, are you ready? Go for it. Unmute yourself, please. Uh, Alex, uh, Caroline, oh, and Charlie. Okay. Okay. It, was yes. it wasn't working. Okay. Go for it. He is the compassionate, the all bountiful. Oh God, my God, thou seest me, thou knowest me. Thou art my haven and my refuge. None have I sought, nor any will I seek, save thee. No path have I trodden, nor any will I tread, but the path of thy love. In the darksome night of despair, my eye turneth expectant and full of hope to the morn of thy boundless favor. And at the hour of dawn, my drooping soul is refreshed and strengthened in remembrance of my beauty and perfection. He whom the grace of thy mercy aideth, though he be but a drop, shall become the boundless ocean and the merest atom which the outpouring of thy loving kindness assisteth shall shine even as the radiant star shelter under thy protection O thou spirit of purity thou who art the all bountiful provider this enthralled and kindled servant of thine aid him in this world of being to remain steadfast and firm in thy love and grant that this broken winged bird attain a refuge and shelter in thy divine nest that abideth upon the celestial tree. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thanks again. Alex, do you want to open everybody?